So we all know about the important InfoSec roles in the 2016 election, but it turns out that in 2020, folks were very prepared and spent a lot of time thinking about InfoSec. And so this next panel has some of the key experts from that campaign in 2020, and they're gonna talk about the threats and the challenges, and of course, how all of this played in the global pandemic. So we've got Tim Ball, who was participant in four different presidential campaigns. He's currently the director of cybersecurity for Civis, which is a election uh, data company. Allison was a security program manager for the DNC. Uh, Krishnan uh, focuses on enterprise security for the DNC. So again, how are elections the same and different from general enterprises? Matt was the director of engineering for the Biden for president campaign. And Will is the CISO for Act Blue, which is a nonprofit political fundraising arm. You're going to hear some great stories. And if you don't have your fill, I encourage you to buy any of these people drinks because I promise you they have stories that even they're not willing to share in this kind of public reported stage. But I think you'll learn a lot and uh, you'll get some insight into what the threats we face, as well as how a organization that doesn't have quite as many resources as some of the best of us still manages to produce locked down security organizations. Hello and welcome today's, to today's panel talk, securing the 2020 presidential campaign, threats, challenges, and a global pandemic. My name's Tim Ball and I'll be your host and moderator for this uh, exciting panel with all of our guests. So we're gonna do a quick set of intros and then we're gonna get into it. So Will, why don't you introduce yourself? Sure, thanks Tim Ball. Hi everybody, I'm Will Rogers. I'm the Chief Information Security Officer at actblue.com. Next to Allison. Hi folks, uh, my name is Allison Go. Uh, I am the Security Program Manager for the DNC. And Matt. Thanks, Tim Ball. I am the head of technology at Zinc Collective and was previously the engineering director at Biden for President. And lastly, Krishnan. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm Krishnan. I'm currently the acting chief security officer at the DNC, um, previously led our enterprise security program at the organization. That's great. And I'm Tim Ball. I'm the CISO at Civis Analytics. Previously, I was the senior security engineer for the Hillary Clinton campaign. So we'd like to begin with some campaign nouns and verbs. Allison, could you explain what a DNC, a BFP, a coordinated campaign, and a vendor? Uh, yeah. So there's, uh, there's a lot of acronyms, as I'm sure, in any industry. So when we refer to the DNC, this is the Democratic National Committee, uh, which is the committee itself. Um, so I was headquartered in DC. Um, we serve as an advisory uh, kind of position to national federal campaigns. Um, the DNC is different than some of our other what we call Democratic sister committees. There is also the Democratic Senatorial Committee, uh, Congressional, governors, attorneys general, leg state legislative, um, a lot of other sister committees, but as the DNC, we focus on national federal campaigns. Um, also join, uh, so Matt Hodges is formerly from Biden for President, which we refer to as BFP. <laughs> um, so that is the Biden-Harris campaign from the 2020 cycle, uh, which is a separate entity than the DNC. Um, so if you think about, we have Biden, we have the DNC, and then what we have what we call the coordinated campaigns. So the coordinated campaign sits in the middle of both of those um, during the general election. So you'll hear us mention the coordinated campaign a lot. Um, so if you think about DNC is over here, Biden coordinates kind of in the middle sphere of supporting both and uh, with input from both sides. Um, we also, in the, the, in the, the democratic politics world, uh, we also have vendors in the vendor space. So uh, Will and Tim Ball definitely very much come from the vendor space uh, and offer a lot of the tech that supports not only the Biden and the DNC campaign, but ticket uh, campaigns up and down the ticket um, from other presidential governor's races all the way down to your local state Senate race. Um, so 
that's kind of a quick run through of some of the things you may be hearing. And if there's anything else that I think we may need to pause and define in a second, I'm sure I'm happy to, to hop in as well. That's great. Thank you very much. So I think we want to get straight into how do campaigns work and how does security for a campaign typically work? Um, Matt and Christian, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, so how do campaigns work? How does security work? It's kind of a big open-ended thing that we could go a lot of different directions with. But from a, from a high level, if we're talking about presidential campaigns, um, the presidential campaign is basically broken down into two legs. It starts off with the uh, primaries. Uh, that is actually the longer of the two legs. Um, and the primaries are the, uh, the, the, the point on the calendar when a number of candidates have uh, declared their intention to run for the nomination. They're uh, all Democrats and the DNC is working with all of them, which can create its own challenges. Um, but they uh, eventually will narrow that down into one candidate um, through the primary elections that go to the general election. Um, once we're in the general election, that's what we normally think about when we're talking about the election cycle, at least for people who work outside of politics, or to thinking of, of the two, two candidates who are running for president. And at that point, uh, organizations scale up very quickly. Um, before we talk about the challenges of scaling up really quickly, Krishna, maybe you could speak about some of the challenges on that first leg of working with multiple primary campaigns. Yeah, that's a good question there. So I think, um, you know, when during the primary season, uh, what's not as well known is that given that you, know, you have, at least in the 2020 cycle, we had close to a dozen or more candidates uh, vying for the nomination, uh, the DNC as being the uh, head of the Democratic Party, um, we have to work with all these candidates, right? They are, they're all Democrats vying for the nomination. So we have to provide them equal levels of support when it comes to uh, cybersecurity. And so, uh, you know, one of the challenges that we faced in that early part of the primary season, especially for these primary campaigns, right, is that cybersecurity is not the top of mind thing, right? They're trying to get votes, they're trying to fundraise money. Um, and so for us, really, it was just trying to get in at the, or as early as possible with campaigns, trying to give them good cybersecurity advice so that, you know, if they became the nominee, right, they had that really strong foundation in place to help them scale up, which we'll talk about uh, down the road. Yeah, to kind of piggyback on that, so um, I think at, 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 as a high point, I think we were working with 20, 25 to 27 different presidential campaigns uh, during the primary, uh, primary season as the DNC. And um, as the DNC, we had very much positioned ourselves as an ad advisor. We'd get in um, as soon as folks had declared and really be like, all right, here are some resources, here are some best practices to start from the get-go. Um, while you scale up your staff um, and move from state to state, caucuses, primaries, uh, and really Matt talked about fundraises and banking those votes um, and making sure you are getting a name out for yourself. But yeah, there, there is definitely the tension um, in the campaign world where basically every dollar you bring in, most of it's got to go to getting votes. Um, and where does cybersecurity fit in there and making sure that it's a priority is always going to be a challenge for us. That's great. So one of the things that I think we've all talked about in the past is about how presidential campaigns are like a giant startup that you've never experienced before. Um, Matt, I was wondering if you could give sort of your ground level take of what it's like being at this crazy kind of startup. Yeah, so I think some of the similarities that you might see on a presidential campaign uh, that you see in startup land is, uh, first of all, this concept of like hockey stick growth. Um, you know, when startups talk about hockey stick growth, they're talking about users and how, how, how quickly can they scale up their product. Um, when campaigns would talk about hockey stick growth, they're probably talking about the number of staff that work for the campaign or work within one of those organizations that Allison introduced, whether it's uh, the presidential campaign itself, the DNC or, or, or the coordinated. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a very fast timeline. I, I think people might look at the presidential cycle and think that it goes on forever. But if you actually take a step back and look at like 
how much happens on that calendar year. It's, it's only a matter of like something like 18, 19 months, and then the whole thing is over. Um, so what happens in that time frame is when a campaign launches, you're literally launching with like 20 people. It is a small group of people who are kind of in the know. They were uh, brought on very early. Generally speaking, those 20 people uh, do not include anyone of any technical or security background. Um, I think the space is making some progress in that, but I think it's fair to say that that is more of an exception than the rule. Um, I think people like ourselves are pushing on that to make that more of the rule instead of the exception. But, but the reality is you start off very small and then you start scaling up super fast. Um, as a campaign is moving through the primary cycle, uh, you start bringing on staff as rapidly as you can afford them so that you can distribute them across the primary states. And so you go from 20 staff to about 200 in just a few months. And like that's 10x growth in just a few months of, of just your staff. And anyone who's worked in um, securing employees' accounts or their devices knows that uh, gro gro growing that quickly can be very, very challenging. Um, you know, your humans are always your most difficult things to, to secure. Um, add on top of that, that even, even before the pandemic, uh, the workforce is totally distributed across the state. So there's, there is this concept of a headquarters, but uh, the majority of your employees are not at the headquarters. They're at whatever field offices when field offices were a thing. Um, or if you're in a pandemic, they're in whatever uh, coffee, I guess coffee shops were closed. They were in their apartments um, and that is distributed everywhere. So you're, you're, you're 10Xing your staff very rapidly. Fast forward a few more months, you get to the general election. Um, you, you literally go from 200 staff to over 2000 staff. You, you 10X this again. And that 10X happens even, even more quickly because as fundraising is coming in, you're spending every single dollar you can on vote acquisition, not on scaling staff in any linear fashion. Once you're in the general election, you go from 200 to about 2000 staff within three, four weeks. Um, it is extremely rapid. And so that just once again um, is an exponential on that challenge of securing not only endpoint devices, but humans and educating a large, a large staff there. Um, the last thing I'll say about the parallels between a presidential campaign and a startup is um, uh, startups generally build out products in an MVP fashion. Um, it's not They're not always the most robust products right away, but then they have the opportunity to iterate on them when they go to market. Um, campaigns are building software. Campaigns are writing code. Campaigns do not have that runway to then iterate and uh, make them robust like most technical organizations do. Generally speaking on a presidential campaign, when you are trying to push something out that your team is putting together, whether it's you're building it or you're buying it or some combination, you build it, you ship it, you move on to the next problem. And so what that ends, ends up looking like is an entire organization built on uh, a term that I used a lot this last cycle, bronze metal software. Um, it does its job. It's not the most lovely piece of software, but uh, as you can imagine, bronze metal software is not only buggy, but can, can create a bit of anxiety from making sure that you're following uh, software best practices, testing best practices, and, and keep, keeping things patched. That's, that's another big challenge there. Um, so th that fast pace and fast growth is where I would say presidential campaigns can feel a lot like a startup. And Matt, I was going to bring up, you have the last point where you have an explicit end date, right? So after election, now your massive 3000 person startup goes to zero, right? So that, that, that aspect of a startup, I, I, it's, it's also crazy because in about two weeks time, you're trying to offboard all these people as they kind of figure out what they're going to go do next. Right. And so the issue there is how do we not again, create more security issues in the offboarding piece, right? So onboarding challenges, offboarding challenges, it's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's very rapid in both directions, and it's it's one of those environments where it's it's consistently high stress. Um, again, like many startups, you're working late hours and and you're you're staring at your desk for 15, 16 hours a day, and that can create um, uh, opportunities to make errors, which I think is is something some smaller technical organizations experience early on. 
Yeah, that's a really great perspective. Uh, I'd like to hear from the DNC folks because I believe there's a lot of sort of myths about the Hollywood idea of what it's like to work both at the DNC and a campaign. Allison and Christian, what do you think it was like supporting so many staff and so many campaigns? Yeah, how, I mean, how did you apply um, resources? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to it from the like, it's not at all what you see in the movies or the TV shows, or it's not at all like the West Wing's version of uh, of what campaigns are. Um, so I very much come from uh, like a field perspective, um, running campaigns across the country, um, and really living in the field and field offices are not fancy <laughs> they're often filled with lots of overworked over caffeinated underfed staff who are working 20 hours a day to talk to voters um to make sure that they know where to vote and that who they're voting for and really mobilizing all of that and that's what the really the bulk of these folks are doing um so even in a non-pandemic year these are extremely chaotic environments and field offices they're not fancy. <laughs> I'm usually there for weeks, maybe at most, months maybe, but sometimes days. Um, you're really flying to a place, uh, do your thing, bop on in the next state, living out of your trunk for a little bit. Sometimes there may not even be an office. Um, sometimes your office is the closest Starbucks or your hotspot in your car. Um, and so like that's kind of the, the chaotic environment of what campaigns look like on the ground. Um, and campaign warriors and field folks, like that's what they do. They go from state to state to, uh, to, to really make it, make sure it happens. Um, and so when we shifted in, when the pandemic happened, not only were we re re reworking the cybersecurity and how do we onboard all of these thousands of people um, at the same time that a global pandemic was uh, coming, what was really impacting America, but also reinventing how a campaign worked from the basics. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I, I don't think that anybody walks into 2020 being like, oh yeah, we're gonna do an entirely remote campaign and everyone's gonna do field contacts and talk to voters from their childhood bedrooms. I don't think that that was really in anybody's mind, but really reinventing how campaigns work and making sure that it was secure and then making sure that people had video conferences and were getting onboarded without us ever even touching their laptops was not something I think any of us had ever thought of. So it was all things kind of combining all at once at the same time on all of us last year. Yeah, I mean, the pandemic definitely, you know, threw a wrench into all of our plans in 2020. I mean, as Matt kind of alluded to, campaigns are these crazy startups. And now you throw in this additional element of, well, you're going to completely uh, take away all of the sort of the norms of how campaigns are operated, right, based out of physical offices where everyone's co-located together. And now your remote setting, um, you know, there were so many challenges, right? Just from like procuring equipment, um, you know, to figure out how are we going to secure all of these human beings, right? Um, you know, we didn't do anything fancy when it came to cybersecurity, right? Um, if you've heard about the DNC security checklist, right? It's just uh, really the, the fundamental aspects of, you know, how a person should really think about cybersecurity in the, in the 21st century, right? Which is, you know, this updating your devices, turning on two-factor authentication, using a password manager. Right. If we get those basic things done, right, we, we, we've, we've sufficiently secured our human beings. But imagine the fact that this is the first time people have ever heard of a password manager. This is the first time someone's ever heard of a security key. And you're doing this remotely. Oh, and guess what? Their internet connection is not that great. So they actually can't get on video with you. And you're troubleshooting with a person who maybe has really doesn't have too much technology experience. I mean, these are kind of the, the crazy challenges that we walk through in, in that span of you know, going from a few hundred people to a few thousand people. And really, this was ingenuity and in us, you know, working those long hours and ensuring that, you know, we had the right cybersecurity posture, right? Because ultimately, our goal was we didn't want to see a repeat of what happened in 2016, right? That's, you know, it's kind of like everyone who works in a democratic ecosystem. Yeah, you know, that's kind of this monkey on our shoulder. Um, we wanted to do whatever we can. And so that's really, I think, what kind of pushed all of us to kind of work, take to do whatever it takes, you know, to ensure that campaigns, you know, were secured uh, in the 2020 cycle. But no, it was tons of fun. Yeah, I think that that was maybe, uh, I can't speak to it because I wasn't at the DNC in 2016, but 
Um, I don't think people had questioned whether or not security was a priority. Like we would come in, you'd, basically you'd start running your presidential and you'd get introduced to some of us on your presidential campaign and be like, okay, yeah, cybersecurity, got it, important. So it wasn't the buy-in question, it was the how question. Um, and so that's what we focused a lot of our time on before uh, uh, now President Biden was named the eventual nominee, was making sure that all 20-something presidential campaigns had access to state-of-the-art resources. They knew who the contacts are. They know what the priorities were. They knew here are the top 10 punch list things that you should do right now to make sure that no matter what size of your campaign that you were set up to succeed because one of them was going to eventually be our nomination and so we were trying to support all of them at the same time and make sure that they all had these standards and practices so that whoever was going to be our bosses eventually when they won the nomination that they were going to be set to go um, and, and really to succeed. That's great. So one of the biggest jobs during a campaign is fundraising. It's a huge job. It's a massive job. In fact, I would say that most campaigns spend most of their efforts trying to help gain fundraising and then doing some earned media to be able to persuade voters. Will, what's it like being a vendor working in this campaign space? What challenges did you have? Uh, fascinating for a start. I will say I'm a relative newcomer to the uh, political space and to the country, as you might have heard. Uh, and I joined ActBlue uh, naively at the beginning of 2020, uh, thinking that it was going to be, uh, you know, lift and shift from every other organization that I've run security in before, and that I would face similar challenges. Um, not only were we dealing with a global pandemic, which obviously introduced its own challenges, um, but I think most people will agree that uh, we've entered a period of polarization in the states that um, probably hasn't been seen for, for quite some time. Um, and that really uh, introduced a whole bunch of other areas of concern that I had never had to previously deal with um, in, in previous roles. So things like disinformation campaigns that uh, you know would, would sidetrack us for weeks um, and uh, take, take energy and effort that we were expecting to, to put into other areas. Um, constant attempts at disruption, um, trying to uh, prevent that flow of money from getting from uh, you know, largely small dollar donors um, around the country um, to, to the campaigns that they are supporting and, and trying to make that difference. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was definitely a wild ride for us. Um, thankfully, we didn't have any, any major incidents. We had no uh, uh, you know, significant problems. Um, certainly not at the sort of 2016 scale, which was a real testament to, uh, to how everybody in the ecosystem worked together. Um, one of the things that we were extremely grateful for was the close collaboration with the DNC and other, uh, not only other sort of um, major committees and campaigns in the space, but also other vendors. Um, I think we, we had a collective mission and goal, um, and it meant that we were able to uh, really lean on each other for support in those, uh, in those times of need. Um, sorry, my mind's just gone blank. We can, uh, we can erase that section. Um, one of the, uh, the other areas that was problematic for us, uh, I, I don't think many people necessarily realize that um, ActBlue is essentially infrastructure, uh, fundraising infrastructure, but not just for uh, democratic campaigns up and down the ticket from federal and presidential all the way down to state and local. Uh, we also um, allow fundraising for um, nonprofits and progressive organizations, uh, which means that we have a whole array of different uh, groups that are fundraising through us and different individuals that are looking to donate to those groups. So we had a, a whole array of additional um, challenges last year um, surrounding some of the racial justice movements um, that meant that there were a lot of people that were very angry at what we were doing, uh, which made it particularly um, troublesome for us. That's really great. Um, I myself uh, work for Civis Analytics. We do data analytics for, amongst other people, many democratic campaigns. We found that the best way that we could help campaigns was by making changes to our software to make it so that campaigns could be secure by default, mandating two-factor authentication. We could monitor users to see if they were or were not using two-factor authentication. And if they weren't, I could ping Matt and say, hey, please get your users to turn on two-factor authentication. Um, that's, to me, one of the bigger changes between what happened in 2016 
where I was working for the Clinton campaign, and five years later. What all other changes have happened? I'm sort of wondering. Um, Matt and Krishnan, we've talked before in the past about the idea of software archaeology, where every four years, campaigns have to resurrect dead code, dust it off, and sort of wonder what it's like. Can you talk about that process? Yeah, Krishnan, do you want to do you want to start here? Because I think I think DNC ends up being the the primary yeah. stakeholder on that. Well, yeah, and I think it's, it's so it's interesting, that, right? Because you know we just had a major election cycle kind of finish up, um, and you know one of the things we're doing at the DNC is kind of going through this process of looking at all of the sort of the products that the BFP side made um, and trying to figure out you know which of these things do we sustain, which of these things do we just you know. Uh, sort of, you know, the deprecate, which things we turn off, um, and yeah, you know, the and 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 to come to to make it difficult, right? The DNC has its own engineering team, right? So we're also trying to figure out like what are the products we want to build out um, that kind of you know sus sustain these boom and bust cycles, right? These four year kind of presidential cycles, and so it's kind of one of these things where you know right now we're in this process of you know figuring out okay, how do we integrate some of the BFP stuff into our current, you know, roadmaps that we've built out um, and really build out, uh, we can kind of sort of be this place where, you know, campaigns can come to and you know, like use our products to service as opposed to having to build out the, the products themselves, you know, from scratch every four years. But it's really not every, it, but it's, it's not they have like four years to do it, right? They really have like maybe 18 or 24 months, really. Um, but even then, it's even shorter than that because you're not going to have a full scale engineering team for maybe about only about six of those months, right? So you're really thinking about like small window of time. How do we sort of make sure that they're only building the things that are absolutely necessary for like a bespoke reason? I think that's one of the problems we're trying to solve on the DNC side. But again, it's not just uh, something the DNC, uh, you know, works on itself, right? We have great vendors such as ActBlue and Civis, right? Who also kind of contribute to this, right? Uh, we don't want campaigns to be building out their fundraising infrastructure, right? We don't want, you know, campaigns to building out data analytics pipelines, right? These are all things that, we think you know should be you know uh, sort of uh, infrastructure that anybody in the ecosystem can kind of come to and use, um, and it also has the security impact as well, right? Because if, again, if you're not you're not building bronze level uh, bronze level code anymore, right? Which is still good, right? Um, you know you're building look you're building code that you know has been has been worked on for years, have many eyes looking at it, and these are not sleepy eyes, right? These are folks you know who are you know working in the off cycle when you know they we, there's like more rest, um, people are you know more engaged. Um, and can you know, actually you know, make sure that we're not making any errors at that point in time. Yeah, I, I'd probably just like drive that that last point home even more um, as a response to like what has changed over the past five years, what's changed since the previous cycle. Um, you know, we, we've seen a pretty a remarkable explosion of vendors entering the democratic political space, which is in my opinion, phenomenal. Um, you know, if, if, if anyone ever listens to me on other platforms, all I'm doing is yelling that presidential campaigns need to stop building software. Um, it's like somewhat ironic because my job at the Biden campaign was to lead a team to build software. Um, and, I, and I'm very adamant that campaigns need to be doing less of that. Um, because if you're building technical products, the, the two most valuable resources that you could have are time and people. And uh, campaigns will give you neither, and then they'll take them all away. So, um, you know, when, when, we, when we talk about this bronze metal software being built in-house at presidential campaigns, it's bronze because you're going very, very fast with a team that's like 20% the size it should be. And then you stand it up very rapidly. Um, and then you tear it down very rapidly. You give it to Allison and Krishnan, and then they have to decide like, okay, where, where is the like devastating time bomb in here that one of, one of them accidentally put? And uh, is it worth keeping alive, or is it worth, or should should we just you know throw it in the rot pile? Um, and then another election happens in just a few months, and uh, you haven't had much time to improve that software. And so either you stand up what was kind of uh, rickety uh, from two to three years ago, or you start from zero again and just rinse repeat that again. Um, with the explosion of vendors in this space who can actually invest uh, long-term uh, people and hours to building products, it, it fixes a lot of that, um, which is great. You know, it, it creates tools that I would say are silver or gold metal. I'm, I'm a big fan of more gold metal software in this space. 
Um, but I think it also creates a, a new security challenge in that the surface area is now much larger. Now, instead of having the DNC and a presidential campaign and one or two vendors that you, you're worried about a security posture, you have the DNC, a presidential campaign, and 65 vendors that you have to worry about the security posture. And each one of those vendors is a new vector into either the DNC or the campaign that they're working with. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, yeah. that's so that's Krishna. I'm probably you're probably thinking the same thing I am. The the vendor space really has expl exploded in the last couple of years, which is awesome. Um, but then also, I think as the DNC is a place again for us to push out standards um, and make sure that those vendors in the space, as they're coming up and developing their product and selling to campaigns and really building their their base of users, that they are doing it at gold standard in terms of cybersecurity as well as uh, their their infrastructure as well. Christian, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, I was going to say, we, we use this term vendor, right? And I think when most people think vendors, right, they think of, you know, a large organization, right? But <laughs> in the campaign space, right, a vendor could literally be a single person with a laptop whose best friend works, you know, on the campaign and the, and the person in the campaign like, hey, we need, you know, you to build something. So it's like, hey, I'm a software engineer. I can build this for you. That's a vendor for us, right? And this is actually more common than not, right? It's one to two people. They know folks in the ecosystem. They want to contribute, right? Um, but again, it, giving the short time frames, right? Cybersecurity oftentimes is not the top of mind thing to the, for them. And so a lot of what the DNC does is we want to introduce standards. We want to kind of ensure that folks are, you know, practicing good cybersecurity hygiene, even at the one and two person level, but even more so, you know, at the, you know, civics and act blue level, which have hundreds of people, right? I do also want to pivot to some of the other things that have really helped us in the last couple of years, one of which is uh, we call the DDC, Defending Digital Campaigns, which is a bipartisan organization that uh, takes advantage of the FEC's ruling uh, that cybersecurity uh, can be be sold at a discount or and or free to um, federal campaigns. Um, this was huge for us last year, um, because if we go back to that, that problem of, all right, so you're getting all this money for your campaign, but it's probably going to be spent on votes and staff, and probably not cybersecurity. Well, one way we can, we can, we can, whenever we were talking to campaigns saying like, all right, you need to buy all these things. And then they'd ask us how much it costs. Um, the DDC and the, and the FEC allowed us to point them to a place where it was either heavily discounted or free. Um, for example, uh, security keys. We deployed out security keys to 70, 80%, a huge percentage of staff for free, um, which is amazing because that's, I mean, that's a lot of money in terms of like campaign, but then it's also like making sure that folks are actually using them um, and enrolling their, their, their devices and things like that. Um, Christian, I don't know if you want to dive into that as well. Yeah, no, I mean, in terms of numbers, right, you know, the DNC, we were all, all staff were required to use security keys, right? So 100% compliance on security keys on the DNC side. On the coordinated campaign, so this is the the, the, the zero to 3,000 back to zero in three months of uh, fund organization, right? Uh, I think we, go, we got like close to 80%. And really the, the main reason why we couldn't get to 100 was just logistics, yep. right? In those last couple of weeks, you're still hiring people, like literally the day before the election, right? You're hiring people, you're onboarding them giving the accounts, it's just hard to get those people, you know, security keys when it takes, you know, four to five days to get to their place, um, you know, and, you know, getting time to onboard them as well. So, uh, you know, just given the logistic challenges, right, I think we did, you know, pretty well, but um, we kind of, uh, of course, our goal is to, you know, get to 100% compliance, you know, I think in, uh, in upcoming uh, campaign cycles. Yeah, for sure. And like four to five days shipping doesn't seem like a big deal, but in campaign world, that's a lifetime. Um, we were onboarding people every single day by the dozens or hundreds. Uh, every single day we were onboarding hundreds of people uh, because every single day mattered. Um, every single day is thousands and thousands of voters you could have talked to. So uh, when towards the end, when we were again scaling up, um, th things were just getting stuck in the mail. Uh, we just didn't have the time to get them a security key into their machines. 
Um, but we got 100% at staff, which was really great. Um, and uh, really, when we're saying 80% of thousands of people in a remote environment where we never touched their things, I think was a huge testament um, to our, our staff, actually, uh, for them to understand it take it seriously and then take that action. Um, I think kudos to them uh, to help really understand that it, it, it wasn't mere Krishnan, it was all of them. Yeah, and it's one more thing on the logistics piece, right? You know, if you talk to anybody in the democratic ecosystem about the DNC security team, they'll probably tell you, A, we're security key shields. And the second thing they'll probably tell you is we're Chromebook shields, right? And, you know, the, we, we made it such that, you know, every, we wanted all staff to be using Chromebooks whenever possible, right? And then unless you're willing, you know, to come up to the security team and give a good justification about why a Chromebook wouldn't work, you're going to use a Chromebook. Um, and of course, during the pandemic, guess what? There were shortages of Chromebooks because it wasn't just the, the it, we weren't the only folks here who were trying to figure out how to deal with remote situations, uh, a work from home situation, and how do you kind of defend your organization, you know, from a cybersecurity perspective, right? You had, you had, you know, uh, schools, you had, you know, nonprofits, all these organizations who typically use Chromebooks, right? Um, were also putting in massive orders as well at the same time that we were. And it came to a point literally where I think we probably were fighting with, you know, like uh, school kids' as Chromebooks, right? We were calling up, you know, every reseller across the United States trying to figure out when the next like pallet of Chromebooks would arrive to them. And I'm pretty sure we were competing with kids who didn't get Chromebooks. I'm sorry if you're a kid, if you're a high school, middle school, elementary school student who's watching this, didn't get your Chromebook, I apologize. It was all Christmas fault. Um, but hopefully it was for a good cause. Hopefully it was for a good cause. <laughs> yeah, we, I mean, I the was. Chromebook market was hot this summer. Uh, that was, uh, we, I mean, we could identify which shipping container all of our Chromebooks were stuck on. Uh, we were absolutely competing for that. But um, yeah, that was another thing. And then, I mean, we can talk about the security checklist. So we required all of our staff to go through the security checklist. Uh, if you want to take a peep at it, we have it on democrats.org slash security. Um, and it's something that we, we require everyone to go for, go with. And we would spend hours of like office hours walking people through this. And Matt, I know you can talk about this as well. And so can Krishnan and really onboarding people into doing those basic hygiene of two factor, making sure you are you ran and using your password managers correctly. And then security keys, walking people through security keys and how they work. Um, I can't tell you the number of times we would do a security key, uh, a consultation and someone would be like, yeah, I got it, but I stuck it in my computer and it didn't do anything. And then be like, okay, well, you gotta do this and then all these steps and then explain it to them on how that would happen. And then they would understand it and they'd be like, okay, I got, now I got it. But like, um, it, it really, it, it, I think that that's something that the security industry really needs to, to, to work on is like, people get this thing, they stick it into their computer and nothing happens. Um, how do we make that easier? How do we make that where they don't have to turn it on and go through a bunch of steps and click this and click that? How is it just on from the get go? Um, and they have to work really hard to undo it um, instead of having to work really hard to turn it on. And like, I heard this from, from folks, doesn't matter uh, what, 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 what their role was, everything from lawyers to uh, a new field organizer to uh, just staff in the middle, like, how do we do this thing? It's, I got this thing, what do I do with it? Everyone else have opinions and, uh, about checklists and <laughs> the security keys? I, I, would, I would add that, um, you know, so my role on the Biden campaign was to uh, lead a team of software engineers. I was not officially a member of any security organization within, within the campaign, but by my nature of, of being someone technical, it became a de facto responsibility, not only of mine, but everyone on my team. You know, as, we, as we've kind of mentioned a few times already is the dollars need to go to votes. The dollars need to be spent on basically uh, getting people to vote and running ads to get them to vote, which means you're not spending dollars bringing on a large IT or security team on the campaign. So to fill that void, um, you know, we had to deputize the software engineers. You, you know you know a lot about computers now you know a lot about security keys because we need you to go teach the rest of the organization how to do that and i think that's a unique uh challenge in this space in that um, more private sector corporate environments can really make that investment whereas like again the time and people works against us um in in a presidential campaign and so why this was extra hard is because it wasn't everybody's primary job it was everybody's 
high high priority secondary job and um, there's only so many hours in the day so when you're trying to onboard again those two three thousand people who just got here in the last few weeks you've never met them in person you're never going to meet them in person and they're working out of their uh, apartment um it's it's part of the reason why i think i think you said some of security keys got stuck in the mail i think some people just didn't get to have that like hand oh, yeah. that they really no, i needed. know that too yeah <laughs> they stuck it in and nothing happened and they were like eh, it's fine i'm gonna go talk to more voters yep you know 30 minutes 30 minutes on the phone with one of us on a help desk they could have gotten 10 people to go vote so yep. think about it that way that's that's how that's how an average field organizer is thinking about their time i do think it actually added uh brought up an interesting point um which is that within the political space you're also fighting against all this but trying to work alongside the, the SEC and, and their, oh, sorry, the FEC and their, uh, their requirements. So as Alison mentioned, the DDC got this uh, um, a, a judgment that said they were allowed to offer these things at a discounted rate. Um, if they don't do that, it counts as a, a donation in kind, and that brings all sorts of, all sorts of problems. And there's a whole array of, uh, of sort of um, uh, legal frameworks and, and compliance regulations there that also need to be taken into account on top of all of the cybersecurity uh, issues that we're dealing with. Right, right. Well, you don't, you don't want to do add, add that. FEC jail is real jail. That's what we always tell people. Like, don't mess with it. <laughs> yeah, it turns out FEC jail is just federal prison. It's um, just jail. So... Add all of this, you guys have already talked about what it was like for part of the pandemic work, but the real job of a campaign, as Allison, you were saying, is, is to change and get voters and clock in voters, like, and getting donations. How do you feel that the pandemic really changed all of our jobs? Yeah, I mean, I wasn't working in the field and, and huge, I mean, props to everybody who works field and digital organizing this last year because they really had to make it up, think of it on the fly. And I, I cannot say that they reinvented organizing enough because they really did. Um, all the fundamentals of, okay, you go knock on somebody's door, went out the window because you could knock on somebody's door. Um, but I, I think the, the, the principles were the same and they really used the tech and the tools and what they had to make it scrappy and harness the energy that we were feeling from volunteers and folks on the ground who wanted to go talk to voters and make sure that they voted for Joe Biden, Kamala Harris and Democrats up and down the ticket across the country um, and making sure that it was successful. Um, and that, that was a huge challenge and really finding uh, and, and I think security and IT and all of our all of our skill sets, including all the software folks, uh, we were really pushing in the same direction because we were faced with this unprecedented challenge. So uh, we didn't want to create more problems. We really, truly wanted to solve them for the staff who was reinventing how to organize and how to win a campaign. So with our last five minutes, I think maybe you can do a quick lightning round about what do we want to do going forward? What's 2022 look like uh, and beyond? So why don't we start with Will? Sure. So uh, the 2020 cycle brought unprecedented engagement uh, from small dollar donors around the, the nation. Um, I think AppBlue raised uh, something like $5 billion um, over 133 million different donations. A um, vast number of those people donated for the first time, um, and it made a, a sizable difference um, to, to the outcome. Um, we want to uh, empower small dollar donors around the nation to be able to continue to get uh, get involved and make their voices heard, but we want to do so in uh, you know, as secure manner as they possibly can. So for us, it's really uh, continuing to innovate on our product, make sure that we can make it as easy for people to, to donate as possible, uh, but making sure that security is baked in from the ground up. Krishnan, you want to build on that? I think we, it would be a lost opportunity if we didn't put a plug in for the fact that you know, we're, we are all hiring, right? So we're looking at 2022 and 2024. Um, all of our organizations are looking for you know, talented staff. On the DNC side, around the technology team, we're looking for software engineers, product managers, security engineers, IT staff. Um, and so if it's something that you feel dedicated to the cause, you want to jump in, 
you want to get your hands dirty and, you know, help elect Democrats across the country, um, this is the time to do so, right? It's not six months before the election, right? When, you know, everyone is thinking about the election, it's, you know, 24, 36, 48 months out, right? This is the time to actually build out that infrastructure so that when we're, you know, going through that crazy startup phase, we have the, the, the sort of the foundation to build off of. Um, I'd say quickly, you know, top of mind, right? You know, for me, just looking towards the next two and four years, um, you know, I think in the last cycle up to 2020, um, everyone kind of understood cybersecurity just because you know, everyone knew what happened in 2016, right? And there was kind of this collective feeling that we didn't want to see that happen again. And so when you said cybersecurity, people just nodded their heads into it. Like, um, I think all the work we did, you know, had a positive benefit, right? We didn't have a major incident, but my fear is that now folks are thinking that cybersecurity, the problem is solved, right? Look, we went four years, no, no major problems. Um, we must be doing things well. Okay, cybersecurity guys, go back to your corner, and uh, and, and you know we'll, we'll bother you every now and then. And so one of my fears is that that same level of this paranoia has kind of gone away because of a lot of the great work we did. Right? It's kind of like a, a it's a weird conundrum to be in. And so one of the the things I, I we I'm trying to do is figure out how do we kind of ensure that cybersecurity is still top of mind in 2022, in 2024. Because guess what? The threat actors are still coming after us. Right? Nation states, criminal groups. They aren't letting up, um, and we need to make sure that you know we are taking cybersecurity just as seriously as we did. Yeah, that's great, Matt. Do you have any thoughts about the what's I don't know what what is the war field uh, war field look like against us and the other side? Yeah, I mean, so uh, it's kind of it's kind of a mismatch. It's kind of a, a, a disbalance here because one of the things that we have to do in the political space is we actually have to report to the FEC every dollar in and every dollar out. And what every dollar out means is we have to report who are the vendors we're paying to do work for us. And while we, we would never be advocating for a purely a, a obscurity oriented uh, model of protecting ourselves, we have to file every single month and say, we paid this organization for this service and it's publicly available and anyone can go look at it. Turns out that's a really easy and convenient place for uh, malicious actors to go and figure out where, where our uh, attack surface area is. Um, so in, in addition to, to plugging that, uh, the, the space itself is hiring, the vendors are certainly hiring as well. And please go go bring your technical expertise to all of the vendors in this space. Um, because um, as I said, I, I, I'm pushing for campaigns in the DNC to build less tech and for these enduring vendors to build more. So, um, you know, thinking about bringing in talent um, outside of the obvious spaces is where we really need to devote uh, a lot of our attention as well. Thanks. Hey, Allison, would you like to put in your thoughts? I know you have them. I have lots of thoughts. Um, I mean, just to, to piggyback on what I think everybody is saying is like, you know, making sure that the culture that we built and, you know, every 2016 shook everybody awake and everyone was really pushing as hard this last year to make sure that it didn't happen again. But making sure that this culture doesn't doesn't end uh, and that we continue it even in off cycles, even though there is no off cycle now um, <laughs> and we are still very much in active campaign mode in multiple states. Um, but yeah, making sure that that, that, that it, culture still exists and then also making it easy to uh, do these security best practices. How do we push to make some of these things more intuitive? Uh, secure by default, like making sure that security keys are easier to use, uh, making sure that it's harder for people to opt out of these things. And it's just like baked into having an account, you have two factors as soon as you set it up uh, and, and, and really just making it more user friendly so that we don't run into the problem of eh, this thing, what am I going to do with it? I'm going to toss it in the corner and not worry about it for a minute. For me. I think that the most important thing that we can do besides please anybody join one of our teams is to make sure that we get as many people as we can to come out and vote because a big part of our playing field that we have to deal with is that our playing field itself is controlled by politicians who make laws that somewhat skew the, the playing field. So with that, I think that's the end of our panel. I'd like to thank all of our panelists.
And I'd like to thank B-Sides Las Vegas for inviting us to come and speak.